Perfect Storm, Knowledge and Value in the Ugandan Aquaculture Industry. Um, a slightly shortened version of the one that went round. I just think it makes it slightly more concise. Um, really, I want to start off by talking through the Perfect Storm and why uh, effectively this work that I'm doing is important. Now, this is a co concept that was developed by Bennington and Goffrey, 2010. And it's, it's fairly straightforward, but it's there's three sort of factors that give this the perfect storm um, outlook. First, the growing human population. I'm not going to mention a statistic that always gets mentioned, about 20, 30 population. Climate change, and then in increased resource consumption. So generally speaking, we are, as, uh, as a race, eating better, um, more protein, that sort of thing. And so therefore, these, these are the pressures, which is leading to what's been called the perfect storm. Uh, where food production systems need to increase their yields by 2050 in order to meet the current trajectory. So this isn't a, a particularly uh, new concept. Um, Malthus obviously sort of perhaps brought this up firstly, but this was, uh, when was this? 17th of January it came out. You may have seen this uh, article on the BBC. It's all about the flexitarian diet. And really this is <coughs> the perfect storm. They looked at it from a slightly different approach in that they looked um, at the idea of you know, what is the diet that we would need to eat to, to feed the planet effectively. Um, I particularly like this line, which is why I've stuck it in here. Consumption of white meat, poultry and fish, because that's what we're looking at fish today, was not associated with increased mortality. Um, that just made me chuckle slightly. But effectively, if you look at it from the sense of red meat, which has got uh, you know, high consumptions of that, has health problems has been linked to, to strokes and, and heart problems and that sort of thing. Fish has no increased mortality, which we're pleased to hear. But actually, we know a bit more than that, because fish is very important in our diet. It helps uh, children to develop. Um, it's an important food source. And so therefore, as a protein source, um, it's well, po well poised to meet some of the needs that we have, um, especially if we start looking at things like a healthy diet. Um, They've also, in this, in this report, they also, like I said, they focus mostly on this idea of a diet, and they talk about the idea of it's beyond the calorific. So for a long time, it was just we need calories. That's what people need, you know. But actually, there's a recognition that we need to go beyond that. But the one thing they didn't really, they didn't really talk about is this idea of poverty and food security. They linked it slightly to the SDG agenda, Sustainable Development Goals. But actually, they don't really talk about it. And for a lot of people that I was working with, or well, practically everybody that I was working with out in Uganda, the fish farmers, if you talk to them about their livelihoods, talk to them about their, their lives, and why they're doing fish farming, poverty and food security is all they talk about. So actually, that's a missing component. That's, I would say, is very important. And perhaps, you know, from a Western audience, it's not the first thing that we think about when it comes to sustainable food systems. But actually, if you are um, in a poverty uh, environment, then that's what you're thinking about, and you're thinking about that for your family. So it's an important part that's missed off. So this is a very uh, rough way of looking at this idea of where these, this increase is going to come from, um, but I just think it's important to understand why aquaculture is booming in Uganda. So past production increases generally have come from improved technology, intensification, bringing new land into production. Generally speaking, that's what we've done. And I'm talking from sort of Malthus era um, onwards. Current predictions, like I said, we need to double food production by 2050. That rate of increase is very much likened to the agricultural revolutions that we've seen throughout um, human history. And uh, the reason Sub-Saharan Africa is so interesting is this whole thing about closing yield gaps. So if we look at where past production increases have come from, which is, you know, new, pr new land, you don't really have any new land available, not unless you want to start clearing the whole of the Amazon rainforest, for instance. There isn't really new land to bring into production, so that's not really a viable option. But large yield increases in sub-Saharan Africa is a very uh, real possibility because their yield per capita is very similar to the 1960s. So if you think back to how farming was... Um, in the 1960s, well, I've done it, haven't I? Everyone always touches the screen, I was told. Uh, and I said I wasn't going to do it, and I did it. It's terrible. Right. If we look at um, the, the yields from the 1960s, say, in this country, 
the, it's the difference between now and then is dramatic, huge, transformative, you know, it's really different. So yield increases in sub-Saharan Africa are certainly a possibility and um, an area that has got a fair bit of interest. And it's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to look at Uganda, or this country in sub-Saharan Africa, for this reason, because I know that actually it has the possibility uh, to vastly improve on yields. So, let's go back, to, let's start to zone in on fish uh, as a protein source. So, you're probably aware of the, the idea of the tragedy of the commons. I particularly like this uh, cartoon. I think it summarises very nicely the issue, which is basically, uh, when it comes to fishing, which is, the, a lot of people think of fishing as where we get our fish from, fish stocks are just overfished. And the issue is there are, you've got so many international fleets and accessing a stock that actually the idea of um, you know, a, a small group having ownership of it doesn't, doesn't really often work that well in practice. And so you have this scenario where everybody is trying to get to the fish. Because if I'm a fisherman, if I hold back from fishing, I don't benefit from that, but actually my neighbour does. And so this is, the, this is the essential problem of the tragedy of the commons. And because there are so many different players, international players, um, conglomerates, all sorts of people accessing fishing resources, it's in very, very difficult to manage well. And actually what we're finding is they're not being managed well and most fish stocks are overfished. So, and to illustrate this, we've got, we've got this graph from the FAO. So the orange is the capture production, so that's fishing. And you can see here, so about 1985 is where we, the worldwide capture peat, at about 90 million tonnes of fish per annum, so that's what's caught. And you can see it's roughly roughly plateaued. The reason for that is not that we're, it's not because people have sat back and said, well, we're not going to, we're going to hold back on fishing. It is because that is effectively the limit. And actually, because we are overfishing, um, that's not a very sustainable limit, but it's, that's where we are at the moment. And the rise, has, the uptake in fish has been from aquaculture. So now around half of all fish that we consume is produced um, which actually, if you think of it in terms of, from a farming point of view, makes sense, right? I mean, we don't, you don't go out into the woods to catch your chickens, <coughs> to hunt them, we, we farm them, and it's just, I think it's a similar thing with fish. So Uganda, uh, fisheries is a very important uh, industry there. They've got Lake Victoria, which we'll see shortly, um, and 30 million Ugandans rely in some way on fisheries. It's incredibly important. But actually, the fisheries have been in decline since 2006. So overfishing happens not only on the oceans, but also in our, in our Great Lakes. And so it's a real issue there. And aquaculture has made up some of the shortfall. So let's look specifically at one of my research questions. Uh, and that's what I want to do, really. I want to spend the rest of the time just going through this question with you um, and having a look at some of the some of the issues that, as it pertains to the Uganda. So, so how is aquaculture being successfully developed in Western and Central Uganda, which is where I was based? So this is a map of Uganda. Finally, you get to see where it is. Um, so this is Lake Victoria down here. And we've got Kenya, Rwanda, DRC, and Sudan at the top. Um, so it's a landlocked country, but you can see there's an awful lot of water around, and there's, and there's You've got all your, all your great lakes as well. It's, it's in the Rift Valley. The, the areas in red is where I did my research. So I lived about there, which was very near the border of Rwanda and the Congo. Um, and it's about eight hours away from the capital, Kampala. Um, so it's pretty remote. And, but I, what I did is I spent my time uh, researching mostly around this area. Some of that took me to Mbarara, which is another large town, so that place here. And then the rest of the time was in Kampala and the surrounding areas. Um, and I was speaking to uh, fish farmers. I did an awful lot of interviews with people in the industry, so extension officers, private consultants, anybody that had anything to do with aquaculture. I was hoping I would speak to them and, and talk to them. Um, so... How has aquaculture developed 
within this region. So early on, so the 1950s is when the industry became established, and it was very much subsistence. So this sort of model, um, dug out ponds, uh, sometimes fed by crops that are growing on the, on the, around, the, around the pond often, because there's uh, yam leaves. Um, and very subsistent, so you know, people, farmers would just leave their fish and just they would harvest in maybe two years' time if they've got anything. They always know if they've got fish because you, uh, you, can't, you can't see. You can see the, the water there is brown, so it's sometimes hard for the farmers to know how many fish do I have. Do I have any fish? Then, <coughs> uh, I don't know, I won't tell you too much about the, de the history of Uganda, but basically there's, uh, the Idi Amin was there in power for a long time. That was a very uh, difficult time in the country, and one of the th things that fell by the wayside was fish farming. Everything stopped, really, with the role of government, and so the subsistence agriculture that was there just kept declining. Um, and so get, you get to about 2000, early 2000, and there's maybe a few hundred ponds possibly around the country, nobody really knows. But actually, that's when the, the, the boom really started, and agriculture, the, the industry started to, to rocket off. And it's partly, I, I suspect that's very much linked, um, not only to the resurgence around the world, but also because the price of fish started to increase, because remember they were fishing in, in the lakes. So important part of the diet, if your fish increases, then suddenly there's this driver to produce fish. And so what you now have is uh, a mixture of different types of farming. There's effectively two. You've got pond farming, which is uh, this, and then you've got cage farming, which... Uh, you're probably familiar if you know about salmon. You know, basically you have uh, big cages and you put your fish in them. You need to feed your fish with pellets um, and you produce fish that way. So this is on Lake Victoria. But there are a number of lakes around Uganda, if you remember them from the map. So these are the two principal methods uh, of, far of um, aquaculture. And the government really has started to push this because they see it as a single way to improve food security, reduce poverty, and increase livelihood resilience. Notice again, the emphasis for them, food security, reduce poverty. So, you know, we might think of it from a health point of view. Ugandans are thinking, actually, this is a way that we can um, incre increase our resilience as a livelihood. So, and yields have more than doubled in the last decade. So, fr from the hundreds of ponds at the turn of the century, we now have thousands and thousands, um, and production has gone through the roof. A lot of that is linked to these cages, which are on Lake Victoria. And e even... Um, even the pond systems, some of them are, are pretty big. So this is just one of the ponds on this project. So something uh, five or six. But I've been, to, I've been to places where, you know, you've got 10, 12, 20 of these ponds, 30 of these ponds, huge ponds, lots of production. So it's, there are two different um, uh, production methods operating here. Uh, normally what you get, so the, if we go back to this map, around this area, which is the city, they... Fish is very close to them, so they're competing directly with. Uh, maybe competing is not the right word, but they they are the sa it's the same market that they're using for fish. So production there is slightly more focused, I would say, because they have to make sure that their price meets the same price as what's been caught by the fishermen. And you also have a lot of cage production here, down here in the in the sticks and the rural air, rural areas. Um, Travelling is, is a big problem. So, for instance, this is um, Lake Edward, and you are about, so we're down here, it's about a two hour drive. It's pretty geographic, you know, it's not many kilometres, it's probably like 50 kilometres, but because the roads are so terrible, it takes an awful long time. So, really different problems for someone trying to produce fish here, because actually they've got a market issue and a transport issue, whereas somebody up here with you know, more developed roads. Uh, very different scenario in terms of produ producing fish. So generally speaking, cage farming is much more, uh, you get much more bang for your buck if you like, um, and so that's what you get a lot of cage farming here. Down here, much more pond farming, although you do get the mixing. Uh, so yes, the two regions. So, one of the ways that aquaculture has developed uh, in this in this region um, is through, well, the, the government are promoting it, it's something called Operation Wealth Creation. So the idea of this is it's delivery of free inputs, and it's the army that are delivering these inputs. And what I mean by that is uh, the two, two things are seed and feed. 
Now we talk about seed just because I, I suspect because it rhymes with feed and because people have it in their mind. Seed is just the, the young fry or the fingerlings that you would use for production of fish. Um, and then the feed is, is pelleted feed um, that they would feed to the fish. So the army is delivering these two things to, fish, to identified fish farmers and they do it for free. Um, I could say an awful lot about Operation Wealth Creation, but the idea in it is, and it's a national program, it doesn't just do fish, it does, uh, they do, they, it's cows, it's apple um, seedlings, it's, uh, it's even maize, I think. They do an awful lot of different uh, inputs that they deliver. And it's, again, household income from poverty eradication, wealth creation, and overall prosperity of Ugandans through facilitation of sustainability. Um, I suspect that most of Operation Wealth Creation, because it, com it comes from the President's office, and the President Museveni has been in power for an awful long time, some of that is possibly linked to uh, the soft power that he exerts, where actually inputs are given for free to people that vote for the party. So there is a little, there's some of that, and some of the, some of the links I found are tenuous, and because of the, the sensitive nature, I, it was a it was a button I didn't really want to press too much with people, but it certainly I think um, it would be fair to say that that is one of the reasons Operation Wealth Creation is part of the political agenda. But the problem there's an awful lot of problem with it. Um, firstly, you'll notice the fact it's the army delivering it. Now. The army have no technical expertise uh, in aquaculture. So when you're transporting live, because the, the live fish, the, the fingerlings, to a farmer, you've got to be very careful how you do that. You've got to have observe the right uh, conditions in the water, make sure there's enough oxygen so they don't die. You've got to worry about overheating. When you then arrive at the site, you have to, they have to be really, you have to be acclimatised to the water. There's an awful lot of you know, technical details you need to know to keep the fish alive. When it comes to this, the feed, again, um, these pellets have to be stored correctly. This is what happens when they're not. So these, uh, this is a cage. You can see the, the floating dead fish. And it's because they were given a feed that was probably toxic, probably had a mould growing on it, which actually ended up killing all the fish. So this is an input that was delivered for free by the government. So uh, there's an awful lot of problems. And then probably the biggest one was the delay. So farmers were told they would be going to be getting these inputs, and then a year later, they still hadn't received them. There's a real problem if you're a, a farmer and you've, you, you, have to, you have to show uh, that you are ready to receive, so you have to get your pond ready. So that involves sort of quite a lot of manual labour. You have to clear it, make sure that it's all maintained properly, no algal growth, all these sort of things. Um, you can do that, and then a year later, that pond is not in, in a good enough condition to receive the fish but you suddenly might get a phone call saying they're here, can you come and pick them up? So there's a real issue of how this program is being administered um, by the government. Let's just paint that picture. And then the other issue, the other way that the government is supporting aquaculture development is through extension. So this graph here uh, it just shows you a couple of years. But basically, it's looking at approved and filled extension posts. So these are... These are um, government experts who would advise farmers on aquaculture and you know, tell them correct practices <coughs> and that sort of thing. But actually, the, the gap uh, between filled and unfilled is still pretty, still pretty high, a 40% gap there. Um, and this is only ones that have been approved. That's not to say that it's, there are enough extension officers. This is just how many extension officers will be in a district. And actually, when I, um, I spoke to quite a lot of extension officers, and generally speaking, they're underfunded, massively underfunded, and there's not enough of them. So, for instance, one district will have one extension officer, if they're lucky, and he'll be in charge of 200 fish farmers. But actually, because they're not, giving any, they're not given any money to travel around, so if you remember back on the map, this is the district here. He might be based here. It takes him an hour and a half to get into the sticks, but he's got, they don't give him any money to get there. He can't afford that on his salary. So what, what do they do? They'll just they'll go nearby and so perhaps in a month they'll visit uh, they'll go to te they'll do 10 visits but they'll be that'll be to three farms because you know they'll visit the same farm a couple of times and actually so that means there's two there's 190 other fish farmers who are not being supported at all so you know i'd speak to fish farmers and they're like there's extension officers just no idea so the extension services are just 
pretty woeful. And, you know, this is a, a, a quote here from an extension officer. Basically, we are not enough for them. That really sums it up. Um, it, the, the extension officer services are pretty poor. So let's go on to the second sub-question. What are the challenges faced by potential aquaculturists? So this, um, I've broken this, I've just given you, I want to give you three sort of areas uh, where, where there are the challenges. And the first one I'm looking at is feed. So this is the, the subsistence model, uh, the pond farm, where basically you have cities of the, the yam lead and the fish come up and you can see the movement here where they're feeding and they just, they will supplement their feed with that. The other, the other principal way of pond is um, uh, algal growth, basically. So you fertilize the pond with uh, some fertilizer. You encourage algae to grow. Uh, again, that's this, you have to be careful how you do that too much and you kill your fish because then the algae take over, take up all the oxygen. Um, but if you do it correctly, then you'll promote algal growth and then the fish, tel mostly tilapia, who are herbivorous, will eat the, the growth. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other way is uh, this mosaic here who is, you can see some powder that he's throwing in from a cut. This is a homemade feed, so he's been advised on you know, a rough feed, and so he'll make that himself with some local ingredients, um, and then he'll feed that to his fish, and they'll come up and eat that. You get much better yields, because the, the, the trick with um, fish is giving them a high-protein diet, because then they grow quick, and then you can harvest them quickly. So if, you're gonna, if you want a fast production cycle, that's what you, you would do. Um, and then there's the, the other end, which is commercial uh, feed. So this is uh, a, is a Chinese chap. Um, there's, they have a, uh, a partnership with China, who is the largest aquaculture producer in the world by a staggering amount. Um, and they have come and run this factory, so they will actually produce commercially, uh, commercial feed and it's pelleted. Um, but you'll notice this is supposed to, this is, they call it, uh, it's a pretty interesting name, something like a friend, it's called a, a friendship between Uganda and China or something like that. But actually, who's operating it here? And this is five years in. So these are the, these are the, the challenges of the feed. Um, this has, this commercial feed, farmers don't like it because actually, if, you, if, you're, if you're producing on the lake and you need a good quality feed, there's not really any quality control. So there's been real issues where the protein content is advertised at 40%, but actually it's 20%. Sometimes it goes off, it's not reliable, it's expensive. So actually the, the, the top end producers will actually ex import all their feed. So they'll get it from um, Israel, they get it from uh, Mauritania, uh, where else do they get it? Brazil. It's because they know that that's, that's stuff that they can rely on. Okay? This it's homemade, so there are issues there because you're not gonna, it's not quite as, uh, it's not even as good quality as this, but the problem with this one is it's very expensive. So for a farmer like this who hasn't got much of a disposable income, this is a, a step up for him and he can produce this. So, but again, the yields are not going to be particularly high. And this is supplementary feeding. Um, and actually, I could say quite a bit about this model. I think actually, if you're, if you're trying to go the commercial model, which is pelleted feed, um, and high yield, that's not sustainable. If, you, however, you want to produce fish in your own backyard and it's more of an idea of home consumption, a bit of extra cash, that is sustainable because actually you don't have to spend any money to produce fish. Okay. Next one, seed. Let's remember the thing uh, So the industry, uh, I would say, is improving in this area of hatcheries. Um, there are some significant issues. So tilapia, which is what they're producing, actually comes from uh, Lake Victoria or the region. Okay, so it's, an, it's endemic to this region, and it's now uh, the second most produced fish around the world. So it's been exported, and there's some very good breeding programs that produce very high yielding um, tilapia, but not here. Here we're stuck with mod with uh, strains and breeds that are maybe 20 to 30 years old and have been inbred and don't produce very well to the point where wilds, so some of the researchers in Uganda now have caught wild specimens of tilapia, and they actually have better yields than the bred variety because of inbreeding and all sorts of problems. But anyway, that's by the by. Um, so you, you get, it's basically this is called a happer, so we actually, you, uh, you allow the females to come in here, you breed, and then you, you, you would harvest the young, and then you sell those, the way to, in that way. Um, this is a slightly more sophisticated 
uh, methods. So you actually breed them in tanks, um, and then you, you would uh, simulate the females to produce, and then you would harvest from that. Um, but there are problems. So here, there's two different species. You've got um, Slapia zilli, which is uh, one, oh, sorry, um, Slapia aurea, so it's called, which is this little one here. And it's a type of strain of tilapia, but it doesn't grow very quickly. But it, how is a farmer to know the difference when they get them? You don't know. Um, whereas here is what we're after. This is the Nilotica strain that, we, that people consume, basically, because it, it grows very well. A much bigger difference in size. But if this farmer's getting a mixed batch, perhaps from this method, not quite sure what species he's got, uh, that's the issues, with, or again, of quality. And then and, and yields I've talked about as well, so the yields are, are much lower than other parts of the world. And then last one I want to talk about. There's a few, there are a few, there are some challenges I could talk about that I haven't, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview. The market is the other one. So um, a lot of the a lot of the fish that's produced um, by the big produ uh, by the big um, producers of fish, so you know the big those big uh, cages that you saw. So you know, they might have. 15, 20, 100 of these big cages producing tons of fish. A lot of that they'll, they'll actually process locally, so here they're being salted. Here, this is where they get dried. Um, a lot of those fish actually end up in Kenya or Rwanda or the DRC or Sudan. And the reason for that is those countries pay a lot more for fish than Uganda does, and so it makes uh, economic sense for them to be uh, transported around. Um, the local market, so this is a this is in Kunjiri where it's a down south, uh, very uh, uh, rurally based. A guy on a, on a motorbike and he's got his fish in a basket will go around and sell those. So very different models. So you've got your big your big boys if you like producing the fish. M they're mostly interested in, in exporting it because they get a lot more money for it whereas your smaller farmers won't have access to that market. Um, often they'll scrabble around the common thing was everybody thought fish was very profitable. They, you know, it's really. I mean, Mr. Venny talks about it. The president he always talks about it's gold and gold in the what does he call it? Gold in the water. So it's really heavily pushed. And the reason is people know it's expensive. So it used to be the cheapest protein. Now it's the most expensive protein in the country. So p people really like it. It's a big. You know, fish farming. Um, sorry, fish is very important there. So you People really like fish and really want it, but the price is very expensive. So they look at it and think, oh, I can make a ton of money from this. But actually, the, just because the, it's expensive doesn't mean that you're going to find a ready market. And that's one of the big problems that the smaller producers especially have. They'll go into it without knowing the market, without realizing, where can I sell my fish? And oh, suddenly I've got to get rid of 1,000 fish because obviously fish don't keep. There's no facilities to store them. Um, Processing them is an option, but they're often not aware of that. So that is a significant challenge in the market. Uh, not much thought was given into that. And this leads us um, very nicely onto the last question, which is this idea of so how, does no how are knowledge transfer mechanisms and intangible inputs influencing um, aquaculture practitioners in the region? And the, the last three points we looked at, we looked at feed, seed, and the market, I started, what I started to do is try to differentiate the different types of inputs. So I'm calling them tangible inputs and intangible inputs. So the tangible inputs are things that we can touch. Um, so you've got, you know, hatcheries here, seed, and, feed, and the feed and the feed quality. This is effectively what operational wealth creation focuses on. This, the, it's all about this. And actually, any literature that you read is all about this. And it's the quality of the fish and it's the quality of the feed, and do we have it, and where is it coming from? Um, and that's all very well and good, and I've shown you some of the reasons why that's important, and it is important. But the point I think I'm trying to make is um, those, those inputs are there. Yes, they're imperfect, and they don't work always as well as they could, but they are available. But actually, no, no focus is given on this, which is the intangible inputs. So it's things like market access and afford affordability. So you saw from my last slide, I started to mention some of these problems. But it's also things like knowledge, knowledge exchange, training mechanisms, record keeping, career progression, infrastructure. And actually, these inputs are important because they are being entirely neglected. 
So let's just have a look at some of the value of knowledge. Let's take that one, one uh, intangible and have a look at this. So these are some of the issues I came across. So this is a, an urban site. You can see here it's, it's a load of rubbish that's just dumped here. Um, I saw an awful lot of ponds with just pollution, you know, bits of plastic and rubbish and uh, washing up liquid that's just sort of come from people's washing. You know, everything just flows into the pond. When you're dealing with fish, their entire environment is obviously the water. So the quality of the water is incredibly important. And you add anything into that, and you're at risk of affecting your production. It's not like farming, where you, know, you might see you could grow crops along here, and if you had bits of rubbish, okay, it's not great, but it's not necessarily going to kill your, kill your crops. If some of this stuff gets into the water, it can kill them like that, because fish are very sensitive to the water, and there's not, a, there's not an awful lot of exchange happening. But farmers aren't, farmers aren't aware of it. That's a problem. They wouldn't necessarily think this is an issue that I need to deal with because they just haven't been trained or taught. Uh, this is a site uh, in rural um, Rukunjiri. Uh, it's a former swamp, which is often the, the, they are because it's a low-lying area, so you can, have, you can build ponds there. But actually, the person that was advised on how to build this, uh, the, per the consultant was a bit of a sham. There's another problem. You get the ex experts who aren't really experts who just perhaps have a degree in something different and just go in and say, I can do this, and then turn out they can't. So just being very ill-advised, and it, to rectify this problem with the ponds, he's got this strange layout. You can see there's a, bit of, there's a lot of wasted ground in the middle there, and that's because it's to try and rectify a problem um, in the design stage of this, which double the cost for the farmer. You've also got things like so tilapia as the primary um, species grown. Tilapia are like a herbivorous, so they're not going to eat this, which is pig guts. So the farmer thinking, I'm just going to help them out of throwing some pig guts into the water. It's more like to kill them than anything, because that can go septic. So, but again, it's just farmers aren't aware of the issues. This one was very painful. A very excited uh, man who'd retired and was full of passion for fish farming. And he, takes, he wants to take us to this fish farm, and this is his fish farm. You know, I mean, I think most of you would look at that and think, how can you produce any fish in that? It's just far too small, just as a starting point. So, but it, again, it's just people not necessarily understanding what they need to produce fish. Let's go back to this chap and look at his profile. His name is Warren, 65 years old male, retired teacher, very, relatively wealthy in the sense that he'd, he had five children and all of them had had a degree, so we'd paid for, which is quite a, uh, quite um, admirable, really. Um, and he's like, he he wanted to get into fish farming as a ret as a retired member of the community, a bit of pocket money, as he put it, but also because he wants to try and educate the community around him. So he really wants to help others. He's, he was a uh, I got on quite well with him. Um, he's got tilapia uh, in in there, but these uh, they're not monosex, so. Just let me back up slightly. So that when you're producing tilapia, generally speaking, you're producing all males because they have the fastest growth. So they're monosex. This is in the big production um, units. Um, but obviously they don't breed. If you're going to go subsistence, where you ask, you want your fish to breed of each other, then obviously you have a mix of male and female. The problem then you have with that is they start to what they call overproduce. So you end up with a lot of little fish. And they don't grow in size because they've reached the carrying capacity of the water. So then they introduce catfish, which is a carnivorous fish, at three months, and the catfish will eat a lot of the um, smaller fish, and then you get both uh, tilapia at a decent harvestable weight, and you get catfish. <coughs> so this system that he's using is this subsistence model where you have um, tilapia, which will grow out, and then the catfish will um, moderate the population to make sure you have enough yield. So that's what he's doing there. And he's, the way that he's feeding them is through supplements, um, and yam leaves, so he'll, he'll grow yam leaves, but also rely on natural fertilisation of the pond. Like I say, the building costs really skyrocketed because of the initial problems that he had. You know, I asked, asked him, why did you get into this? You know, we, we, I've been watching fish farming in television. I've been seeing cage fish farming, because it seems to be very productive. I can see people harvesting fish like Irish potatoes. Um, uh, in Uganda, they, they call Irish potatoes that's what they call them, because they have sweet potatoes as well. So it's, they call them Irish or sweet potatoes. It's not slightly amusing for the Irish all the time. So anyway, so he just, he, he took an interest because he thought he could make money from it, wanted to demonstrate to the community this is a viable way of producing food. 
This is him on the site, so you can see some of the issues here. And it's basically to do with uh, it just wasn't sh it was it wasn't it was too shallow at this end, so they had to extend the pond out, and so then there was sort of a strange arrangement. So. Looking at the importance of intangible inputs, I just wanted to quickly look at one model which is working particularly well, which is this, uh, this Fish Farming Cooperative Society. And this is a group that have come together and they've got a very dynamic chairman. And they, have, they basically look a lot like this. It's this sort of person that's doing it. But they are working in a, in a, in a not a, in a, they call themselves a cooperative, but they're not. They're an association. They don't share their profits or anything like that. But because they're working together, there's an awful lot that they are doing which is uh, producing very good yields in a way that the individual fish farmer isn't. So, for instance, you've got here, this is the, you have the chairman here. Looking at the, this is the fish that was produced by one of the members. They had a meeting and they fed everybody. Um, and they wanted to do that to show, actually, yes, you can do this and you can produce um, a, a good yield. So they're doing that. And then you've got here, this chap here is a graduate... Uh, to diploma level in aquaculture and fisheries. So he has uh, the theoretical knowledge on how to produce fish, and he's giving a demonstration to the rest of the members on how this is a happer. Do you remember those things where you breed fish? He's showing them how that's produced. But most farmers who are operating in isolation would have no access to that at all. So this is a model that's um, working well. Um, and I just think... Uh, in all the time I saw there, I thought associations are very uh, simple, um, a very practical tool on how um, aquaculture could be developed in a way that would really help the whole industry and wouldn't particularly cost the government much, which is obviously a, a problem. So the Commissioner, the, the Assistant Commissioner for Fish Farming and Aquaculture recognises the value. This is quite ironic in some ways, but this is a quote from him. Uh, he talks about it's actually promoted, it's very rich knowledge. Uh, you're going to share the knowledge, share experiences and what you've been doing that will help you and your other colleagues who benefit from it and improve and do better. So there is recognition from the person in charge that the value in associations. The question then is probably why is nothing being done about them? Because there is zero policy, uh, zero initiative to help um, aquaculture develop other than seed and feed. These are the only two things that I've really focused on. And I just, th you know, some of the value that you get, so you have this market access and affordability. So farmers, uh, if they want to ship abroad, they're not going to be able to ship, um, sorry, not ship, it's the wrong terminology, drive on your truck, drive across the border. You're not going to be doing that with 900 fish, but you might do that if you get together with your neighbour who's also producing fish. Um, you work out how to, um, to dry them, potentially is one way they might do it, and then you could maybe, you know, w work together and then sell or you, you've got the power to start selling to large suppliers who need that constant flow of, of goods. If you're doing it by yourself, you have a harvest once every 9 to 12 months, depending on how well you're doing. Suppliers aren't particularly interested in that because it's a one-off crop. They need that regular um, source of product. So associations could provide that as a possible way. Knowledge exchange, that's particularly important because they, would, they start talking to each other. And some of those poor practices that we saw... Um, get avoided because farmers are able to share with each other on, on how they're going to be doing that. Access to government resources in the sense that they're much more visible. So this, per, the Assistant Commissioner is addressing this group, which is a, quite a coup, really, um, you know, that fish farmers have contact with the highest level of government that's involved in their industry, um, purely b the merit that they are in a group together. Um, infrastructure equipment, there was promises made that, you know, we'll give you some nets and things like that. And then training opportunities, access to people. That, so they had a, uh, they got in touch with an NGO from the Netherlands who sent across one of their experts on aquaculture who came and delivered a whole bunch of training with them and went and visited farms. So associations can be incredibly valuable um, as, a, as a way of developing this industry. So then this is, pic this is a picture of the chairman's site. So you can see it's uh, a lot of the problems that you have in some of the other farms you don't have. So the ponds are well-maintained. Um, the correct depth and all, you know, they meet all the requirements for that. Again, he's feeding them with feed, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but he, at least the, the diet is much more, the, sorry, the form is much more likely to be correct. Um, they've even got concrete outlets, which is quite a novel thing. So it's just a 
much better managed farm. But the important point is that the members can come and see this and see what a, a, pro a successful agricultural project can look like. Um, I also want to just quickly touch, with I'm almost done, uh, looking at mapping knowledge flows. So I talked about the isolated fish farmer. You don't need to take this all in because it's, it's a bit much, but effectively this is, this is them here. And this is probably 95% of the industry. And their only source of input are these promotional TV and ra radio pieces, which are much more about encouraging people to do it than explaining practicalities. And effectively, I call them a puff piece. It's, you know, it's promoting a, a model of farming. Um, but actually, associations bring these isolated people into a group, and suddenly they have a whole access to this top level here, which is the organizational mechanisms um, and the, the industry that does exist and would help people. Uh, this, so classic, where did you get the technical knowledge and how to build a fish farm? I must be frank, I just looked at it and thought, wow, we could dig a pond here. That's very much a lot of um, farmers thinking about how to adopt this. So I think from that last point, you can see a refocus on the value of intangible inputs is certainly needed within this industry. Uh, like I said, there's zero consideration given. The closest they come is, the, is adopting extension offices. But it's, it's, that's a very small part of the budget, and they're underfunded, and they aren't really allowed to do their job properly. Um, and then I think linking uh, this idea of linkages between micro-level realities and the macro-level policy is needed. So we talked at start at the top of this by talking about the perfect storm which is very much bringing home these huge problems that we have in the global food system. But actually, they're realised at, the, at the, the individual level. But <coughs> the disconnect between those two is huge. There's a massive disconnect. Um, the, as an emphasis on... Let me just go through this. Look at, bring this one up here. So this idea of the perfect storm has been used, and it ref references constantly these, these large-scale problems, you know, climate change, uh, what are we eating, you know, healthy diets, all this sort of thing. But the, re the, the macro, I would say, is equally important because actually that's where the production mostly comes from, especially in, in, in somewhere like sub-Saharan Africa. So that needs to be focused on that. I think uh, more practically, uh, a promotion of country working models such as associations, I think, uh, the, you know, I'm not trying to say that associations are the be-all and end-all because they're not, but actually a successful program where they encourages them, tries to um, resource them, uh, encourages it, you know, wants to develop them, would, be, would definitely go a long way to supporting this industry. And then this idea that you know, training and building of knowledge exchange mechanisms, because underlying all this is the reason associations work so well, really, is because there's, this, there's a network suddenly where people just talk to each other and you have knowledge exchanging up and down the chain from right to the, the smallest level producer all the way up to the top. Um, you know, and academics and all that sort of thing. So the, the, these are probably my uh, recommendations for the industry. Um, and that's it. So that's my presentation. So I'd love to take some questions from you and some thoughts.